Yep. Thank you. Great. Okay, so welcome to the second meetup uh, of UX Quiz uh, this season. Uh, I'm Johannes Feneris. Uh, next to me are the meetup organizers, Dimitris Navis and uh, Dimitris uh, Stathis. Um, just a very quick uh, intro about UX Quiz. The UX Quiz is a community of people uh, in the fields of uh, UX and product, actually not only in Greece, but the community started from the Greek local communities and events. Once every quarter, we welcome speakers from all over the, the world in those fields. We have the opportunity to discuss hot or not uh, topics with them. Uh, we like those events to be like discussions, not just interviews, not just presentations. Uh, so today, as every time, we expect your questions to guide uh, this uh, session. Um, to be a member, just follow the LinkedIn group uh, so that you, you will get notified you know, on each uh, next event. I'm going to give the link in the chat uh, in a minute. Uh, before we uh, we welcome today's uh, today's guest, uh, a thank you to our sponsors from Scott Studios, Zansin Labs, the UX Prodigy, and WeatherXM, uh, who support our events and are also offering some great uh, books as gifts. The rules are very simple um, and well known. If it is not your first time here, but if it is, uh, here are the rules. Just write a message on LinkedIn saying hi, uh, introducing yourself, saying thanks to our guests. Uh, even better, sharing a moment uh, from this event with your network. Do this using the hashtags UX and UX Greece from now and for the next five hours uh, until the uh, day ends here in Greece. Uh, the usual reminder to everyone, please don't keep your questions for yourselves. Ask them in the chat uh, or ask in the directly by raising uh, your hand. So that was a very quick intro because I need uh, to have uh, as much time as we can uh, with Indy Young. A great pleasure today to welcome you, Indy. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. What we can say about you, there are not uh, enough words. Uh, over 30 years uh, in this field of uh, research and design, founding partner of Adaptive Path. Um, you're the first published book by Horizontal Media, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the one and only uh, Mental Models. Uh, you were the, the one who reduced the wider audience, the method of problem space research and uh, author of the book of Practical Empathy and third time author this year uh, with the book Time to Listen that released yeah, exactly some months ago. Uh, your official role, uh, a researcher, a researcher who coaches, writes, teaches about inclusive product strategy. Three great words to see in this role, inclusive product strategy. Indy, welcome again to UX Greece. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much, Giannis. Oops. Oh, and now everything has changed on the and screen. Now, yeah, because of the... <laughs> and, uh, okay, great. So, okay. Indy, uh, let's talk about your latest book. Um, yeah. Which, by the way, I believe that, uh, for me, it was one of the few books that it creates so many questions, and then uh, we have the answers right there in the next chapter. So I was so glad getting all those questions to discuss today, you know, but I was getting busted each time because you had the whole chapter as an answer to my every question. Uh, so I'm going to start from the end of your book and pick okay. the last style, the last line, which is okay. now is the time to listen. So my first question, our first question as a community to you is why now? Why now? <laughs> I was going to title the book just, you know, listening deeply, but the word time kept creeping into all sorts of conversations I was having. And, um, and time is time has done some really weird things during the pandemic. Like we can't keep track of it anymore. <laughs> um, so the idea is that a lot has happened recently that has helped wider and wider communities become aware of the kinds of harm that we're doing. And more and more organizations are not brushing that aside. They're actually looking at it and they're saying, hey, what can we do about these harms that we're causing? Um, we're causing harms to uh, people who are um, disabled. We're causing harms to people who think differently. We're causing harms to people in you know, different countries or with different cultural backgrounds or different experiences. Um, and it, it seems to be sort of you know, like all the weird politics that have been happening around the globe the past few years, um, all the all the things that blow up on social media, there seems to be a m bigger appetite to actually face and then address this. And 
I'm like, okay, I've been trying to get people to address this for 30 years <laughs> and it seems like it's time. <laughs> but, but not only that, there's also the flavor of time where we make time to do this. I just saw an ad for Rosenfeld Media Workshop and every bullet point was about speed. And I'm like, can we not sort of step back and see like, what, what is it that we value about speed? Why do we value that about speed? And when we compare it to, if we're going fast, leaving people behind and actually harming them, why is speed the, the thing that we put the most value on? We use it to market everything. So the taking the time, slowing down, that's another aspect of now is the time we, I mean, a few decades ago, we had, you know, the slow food movement. Let's not have fast food. Let's actually make our food. And um, we're talking about regenerative agriculture as opposed to just like quick crops one after the other. So there's a lot of different fields that talk about it. And one thing that I heard just the other day, even there's a sport called basketball I'm pretty sure you know about it. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure you realize that it's a multi-billion dollar uh, organization or organizations, plural. And one of the things that I learned yesterday was that the referees call the shots, right? So they'll call if there's been a mistake. Um, they'll, they'll be watching. There's a whole bunch of referees on the court when the game's playing and they'll be watching everything. They don't root for who's winning. They just watch to see to make sure the game's played correctly. And those are humans. And they're taking time. Not only are they taking time during the game, but they're taking time before the game. They have meetings with each other before every single game. Not only that, there's a panel of professionals behind the referees who go through slow motion, all the recordings of all the games, and they judge each call that each referee makes, whether it was, um, whether they called the, uh, the bad thing, I don't know, there's a word for it, <laughs> but if something bad happened, whether they noticed it and called it or they didn't notice it. Um, and if it was a good thing, whether they, didn't call it and let it go because it was a good thing um, or whether they called it by mistake. So they're judged on those four things. That panel is taking time. Those referees are taking time. Time is not a foreign concept to a lot of different ways of life and organizations around our globe. It just seems to be this speed thing is I don't know, hooked into technology and then got spread out through service design. Um, so I don't know. That's why. That was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. And you gave me so much assist talking about basketball. Uh, so, uh, okay. yeah, I'm going to continue going backwards where the, the penultimate phase, uh, phrase uh, you say in the book is that the result of taking time to listen deeply will be, um, the result will be significantly less harm. So let's talk about harm. You talk about, you, you said the, the word harm. I have heard uh, people in the field stating that, you know, at the end of the day, we're just creating digital products. We, are not, we cannot do harm. So taking risks are acceptable in most cases. And my favorite of all, let's do 100 uh, design tasks uh, with risk instead of doing, you know, 50 design tasks uh, by being, uh, you know, by evaluating them. Uh, because at this point, we need velocity. We need speed. Velocity is a, a term that it's being discussed a lot um not lately but then you know yeah for some years so what are the different levels of harm uh, and to paraphrase the obvious question how do we buy in the stakeholders how can we speak of harm in a way that they can hear us and understand us right right exactly so that that idea that hey we're doing things that are digital so they can't do harm is a complete fallacy um you know i've been i've been doing social media posts about examples of harm. Um, <clears throat> and we'll just take one, for example, um, someone was using the interface on a microwave to defrost a piece of bread, which you don't wanna defrost for very long. 
and they started it. They went out to the garden to pick the rest of whatever uh, they were doing for lunch and they came back in and the microwave <laughs> was like roiling smoke and the whole kitchen was full of smoke because somehow their finger like just barely moved the wrong direction on the keypad and it got set to 99 minutes and 99 seconds. <laughs> so, okay, there's some harm. There's a lot of different harm there. Um, and when I talk about harm, I'm like, you know, I have to talk about, I have to make up some levels. If there are other levels out there that exist in other fields, I want to know about them. But I came up with four different levels of harm. I came up with mild, where it's a, a person's confused or frustrated. These are the normal things that we're finding when we're doing our evaluative research with our services and with our products. So um, th that's typical. The next level, though, <laughs> is serious harm, where you're making someone feel threatened, you're making someone feel uh, discriminated against, or you're triggering them from past experiences of discrimination or past experience of something very emotional. You're perhaps making them feel unwelcome, um, which goes toward what Kat Holmes talks about in her book, Mismatch. Um, it, it is the idea that you're making the situation a little bit uh, other, right? It, it is not something that was built for that person. Why was it built that way? Probably because you weren't thinking. Our teams just aren't, aren't used to thinking that far ahead. And so we'll, we'll get to that again a little bit later because I wanna talk about how to think about it. But there's a, a third layer. And that is lasting harm. I keep changing this up. So you might have seen an image of it where I have different words for the four layers. Uh, but the lasting harm is where maybe you've lost money or you've lost um, some, some, you know, it, by injury, some, some part of your own physical, uh, their, uh, you know, you -ness. <laughs> maybe you burned a finger and you're not going to get the skin back for weeks or something. Um, maybe it's mental. Maybe you've been harmed mentally and you, you have to recover. These are the points at which you have to recover. This is also where um, someone might have uh, been, had time st stolen from them or money stolen from them. And I think time, I, I categorize interruptions as serious harm, but if you are not only interrupted, but you have to spend 45 minutes filling out the same information that you just filled out for another agency within one, say, civic uh, service, um, that's time you're never going to get back. Uh, so why didn't we think about that as we were designing these systems? We, I think, I, I'm not blaming us because we've come, you know, we're, we're just sort of <laughs> taking these first steps into being super good at providing services and products. And we have taken these first steps and done some really great things. But now is the time to do better, to pay more attention to the details, to slow it down so that we can actually hear and see and understand other ways of being in the world so that we can support those people as well. So the, um, the idea of uh, that kind of serious harm is something that I'd like us, I haven't figured it out yet, but I just wanna put our awareness out there. Like, let's try thinking about these different kinds of harm. The, the fourth level of harm is systemic harm. And that's the one where it's something that was a part of our history that got baked into our culture or baked into our laws. And we don't think twice about it. Like, you know, sure, let's throw all the, um, the, the criminals who deal in drugs in jail, but there's like different layers of drugs and different levels of interaction with them. And we're just like going to take it all into jail and you know that's 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 a that's an approach that was not well thought out that wasn't thought out with regard to humans on the other end of it the prison system who 
never has been well thought out. It is like where the people <laughs> who like to torture other humans go to work, I guess. <laughs> um, I Probably not true of all, all prison officials, but um, who knows what's what the mindset is in there. And I know that um, there's a really good podcast called Ear Hustle uh, that was made by inmates at San Quentin, our prison, who's right here. <laughs> and it's a really interesting one because it gives you a look at what's going on. It's like, these are real people. Um, they're creative, not all of them, but yeah, it's an interesting sort of way of like, let's get more detailed with these things that we've systemically, historically just like labeled and put aside. I don't want to see it, right? Okay, great. And how can speak, you know, of uh, about harm and the different layers of uh, yeah. So harm how can you speak to, yeah. to the one that they have to hear us, and you know, we yeah, have to buy yeah. them in still in 2022. Right. Yeah. So one of the things um, that I like to have people do there's there's a couple of answers to this about the persuading stakeholders. Um, and by the way, I'm doing I'm helping host a persuading stakeholders workshop. In January, Dewan Stanford uh, is going to lead it. And there's a lot that's that, like lots of different angles with regard to the angle of harm. What I like to do is take something that we've got from our own research about our own product and say, look, these are the kinds of harm we're doing here. You know, here are the, the patterns that we got from these evaluations or here are the people and the various ways that they've been harmed and map it out on those four levels of harm. The other thing that I do is to fix it. Like you have to show them that there's harm to get permission, right? To get the budget to go and fix it. And fixing it is at the other end. And that's where I do some other help harm mapping and tracking. Um, and, and so that's a little bit more of the answer, but the way of trying to help people become aware of it is one of the answers is that there's a couple of other angles, one of which is developing relationships with those stakeholders one-on-one uh, -on -one so that they begin to trust you um, to actually take a step forward and say, yes, I am in this career and I'm in this career for some reasons and I want to make my presence uh, here in this organization valuable to this organization. I'm not a cog in a wheel. I'm going to participate. This means building relationships. This means understanding how other people that you're working with um, think. How, what's their interior cognition and where did it come from so that you can understand how they make decisions and you can actually begin to relate to how they make the decisions and learn their language. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And so we're talking about, oh, please, yeah, go on. No, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we're talking about relationships. So we are always talking about the stakeholders and the bad stakeholders and the business stakeholders that they don't understand us and they don't you know, give yeah. us money to do research. But yeah. what about, uh, we said about doing harm. So do you think that now, mm -hmm. today, people in the field of product UX research, they are actually researching, designing, making decisions. Um, do they feel this weight uh, regarding doing harm in on their shoulders or not? I think they do feel a weight, but they might not call it that. So I think a lot of us should, like got called to this field because we have this at our core. This idea is like, I could help that person better. Like we've, we've grown up, we've seen things. We're like, sometimes it'll come out as like, I could make that better. Um, but often it'll come out as like that poor person, <laughs> I can make it better for them. And that's kind of our touchstone. I think that that's very much why a lot of us have joined this, this field. Um, and then we get into a job and we get into a process and we realize that our hands are tied, that we're being asked to do things like <laughs> somebody that I know was telling me this long story about how her, um, their manager was uh, asking them to make a chat bot. 
And they're all, they're, they kept showing their manager all the reasons why the people that they're making the chat bot for weren't going to use the chat bot. And that manager, she's all like, no, just make the chat bot. That's what we're doing. And I think that's the weight that we feel. I think that's what we're feeling. We're like, wait a minute, this isn't how I thought it was going to be. This isn't how it should be. I'm not able to do the things that I feel are correct. No one's listening to me. And that weight, we're labeling it that way. But if we actually can take, like, say, that chatbot thing not matching what people are trying to get done, what their purpose is, it's not serving them. If we can instead look at it from that window, we're all like, oh, it's a harm. We're doing a harm, right? Can we get more specific about the harm? Can we figure out like why we think it's a harm, not just in general, a, a, a stakeholder is not going to like change their mind because you're all like, we're doing harm. You have to like describe it. So, you know, going, there was another sample that I put out there and these are just examples in social media for, for us to start becoming aware of chances to think about the harms that we're doing. And this was a story from the person's point of view. The person had taken their car in for an, uh, like to get the oil changed or something, maybe the brakes, oh, I think it was the brakes. And um, while it was at the shop, you know, they're driving it from one place to another and it gets hit, it, a little dent in the door. And this is an older car. Um, they had insurance because uh, it was on their property. So they apply for the insurance and the insurance company is all like, that car is too old. We're not going to fix it. <laughs> and so they tell the person who had brought the car in. Of course, they tell the person who had brought the car in immediately before you know doing the insurance, which is the right thing to do. But that person is 82. And that person has a history of being discriminated against. And so their initial reaction is defensive. Like, what did you do to me? Did you do this on purpose? Right. And they call them in. They say, hey, we're going to get you a, a replacement car. You can have it as long as you want. Um, here's the key fob. There's the car. And it's this big, giant red vehicle. Uh, and these new cars these days, you don't have a key that you put in the ignition and turn and they did that to somebody who's 82 and they walked off and he had to, he's like, I, I don't know how to make this car go. <laughs> um, had to go find somebody, right? So there's, there's a feeling unwelcome. That's a feeling of abandonment right there. Great example. Mm -hmm. Also the idea that the car is huge, much bigger than the other car that he brought in. There's a mismatch, right? Now I'm feeling a little bit threatened because I might not be able to drive this car as safely as the old car that I drove. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So we can, the, that story goes on, but those are some good examples. Like if we can get some really specific touch points and use, use the data that we've got to find those touch points. And then when we talk about it, we're talking about it. Like that was some serious harm there and a little bit of lasting harm. I'm thinking that, uh, is there any risk there to, you know, uh, merge empathy with sympathy while thinking about harm as designers? And is this a risk or not? Because, you know, sympathy, uh. empathy, the whole discussion about what is what and how, what we have as a... As a skill right or not yeah so is there any yeah. risk there to have more sympathy yeah. than empathy and so you know feel the weight uh, on our shoulders but not the right uh, it's not the right you know drive to so here here's where i'm going to switch gears and talk about what research is so we've got quantitative research we've got qualitative research uh, we've got organizations somehow who love to run by quant because qualitative is like human wishy-washy stuff. They think of it as two ends of a spectrum and quantitative is valid and qualitative is wishy-washy. And that's wrong. They're actually two different spectrums and they each have 
a really solid empirical end. That solid empirical end means that it is verifiable, okay? The subjective end is where it's squishy and both of them have it, okay? You can make a lot of assumptions. The in specific, the squishy side of qualitative is our anecdotes. And so if we get one anecdote about this car, right? That's a story. It's risky to make design decisions based on a story. Okay, maybe you've got two or three people who have the same story. It's still risky to make design decisions on their specifics. What we need is the empirical side. And in qualitative data, the empirical verifiable data is, gener is generating patterns. It's, 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 you, will, you will have it if you see patterns coming out of your data. Okay, so yeah, so one, one part of that is that when we talk in story, when we talk in, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing stories, but we have to do the stories based on patterns. And so I like to make patterns of approach and patterns of thinking, thinking styles. And then I'll take an archetype thinking style. I'll put a character, like a TV show character that represents that archetype, that thinking style in a context, or maybe two characters that represent two different thinking styles in a context. And I will tell a story about that. And that may have items from some of the patterns that we've seen, but we're very specific about which part that we're talking about. So we're not just doing general, you know, feel good, you know, I want to pull your heartstrings stories. Yeah, give me great pass to talk about, uh, you know, the average solution approach, but I'm going to hold this question because okay. John one is, uh, wants to ask something regarding, no, John, would you like to, uh, to give the question directly to Indy? Yeah, sure. Oh. Yeah, good afternoon. Hey, Actually, good morning. I don't know where you're based. <laughs> uh, so uh, in product discovery, let's say a new product, when is, when is the most harm done? Ooh, um, I think the most harm is done. I've worked with a lot of uh, people at startups. The most harm is done when we say this is going to help everyone. When we fail to figure out which thinking style we want to start with. Um, mm -hmm. We want to we make a product that would have the biggest impact. But unfortunately, it's not going to get off the runway if we're trying to serve everyone because that's just too much for a group of people to do in a certain you know period of time so that's the first place that i start as i'm like who everyone i'm like okay let me ask again who <laughs> right and then we we have these long discussions about who is it that is important to start with because you want to you want to launch you want to get off that runway successfully and successfully support those particular people, knowing that there are other thinking styles out there, knowing that there are other approaches out there that you will support next once you have figured out what this priority is to get your own org, your own small org in, in shape to take on the next step. And let me ask a close-ended question then. Yeah. So during that period, who gets the most harm, the users or the company? Uh, during that period, I, I so during the period of creation or during the period of launch, because it's two different answers. The product discovery, I would say creation and, but answer it the way you want it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think anyone's getting harmed during the creation. I think, well, okay, let me say, during the creation, the organization is going to get them harmed the most because most of the time they fail, most of the time because they, they did not think about who. They didn't narrow that focus down. Also, the other half of that is that they harm themselves by thinking of people only through the lens of their solution. So they think of people only as using their solution as opposed to thinking of people who have a purpose and they're going to use a variety of solutions to address their purpose 
how do we fit? So we need to know who, and we need to get outside the lens of the solution, because those are the two things that I think during that first stage where you're trying to discover what to do, we think we, we want too much, we're too ambitious. And I don't think that we have, I, I think that there are a few, I think what is the fail rate of startups? Like about 96% or something? Something like that, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the ones that get through are either thinking very carefully about this or they're just lucky. They're just like, oh, I came up with this <coughs> idea. It's my idea and, it, and everybody's going to love it. And so that's more like when you're working, like there's a difference between creating to support people and creating to, I'm going to use the word impress or entertain people. So like if you're a movie director, if you are a, uh, an artist, if you are a chef, that's different than most of the work that we're involved in. That is a person's expression. A chef is expressing themselves through the food that they make. Um, and people may love it. An artist is expressing themselves through the things that they make and people may love it a director, an, an author, they're doing that. And that is not necessarily in support. You don't need to know like, who are your people you're expressing, right? This is my gift and I'm going to give it to the world. And that's one way of thinking. And that's perfectly good, but it is not when we're trying to design a better service for someone or a solution that someone who has, you know, heart disease can use. Um, something like that, you're looking at it differently. You are not expressing yourself. You are trying to get your head into what that person's purpose is, understand it in minutia so that you can then choose and prioritize where to start. Does that help? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> A lot. The, the media. Yeah. I want to ask. Uh, I want to ask you to elaborate on when you say who. I think there's a treasure hidden underneath that uh, single word. Your definition of uh, you need to know who you're designing for. Uh, I think it would help us to understand more of what you just said. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Certainly. So um, let me see if I can come up with a good example. Let's say, I don't know, let's say that you're um, a little freewheeling research, um, what is it called? I forget, my brain, it's too early. Sometimes within really large orgs, like an insurance company, there will be a small freewheeling place where they get to experiment and they come up with new product ideas. Okay, there's a word for that, which I've forgotten. <laughs> and that, a oh, research and development, that's what I'm thinking of. Um, and so that small team may want to come up with a new product, right? So let's say they're in a really big, maybe multinational company. Um, they've got this money, they've got this period of time, they can either you know, do this thing where they think of themselves as I'm gonna express my ideas, right? Or they can think of themselves as a technology person or as an engineer. Like this is just how it is built and we're just going to build it a little bit better. Um, if you think about like a washing machine, this is a great example of that. A washing machine is very much of an engineering thing. When you look at the controls on it, it's very much telling you what the machine can do, but it's not talking about what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say that R&D team, research and development team is going to come up with a new product. They could go the route of like, okay, let's look at the existing product and like, you know, gussy up the, uh, <laughs> the controls here, make it sing songs. I don't know. <laughs> or they could go and listen to a lot of people, maybe about doing laundry, which would maybe be framed too narrowly. Maybe listen to people in terms of how they take care of their clothing. Mm -hmm. Because if you frame it a little bit more widely, and I'm framing by a purpose, by a person's purpose, 
how do you take care of your clothing? And I actually cast it in the past tense. How did you keep take care of your clothing, um, you know, over the last couple of months? And that's where we'll come up with uh, interesting approaches. Um, say someone's in a small apartment and um, they don't have any place to hang dry their clothing and no balcony. So it's being hung on that little ridge that goes across the doorway to the bedroom, right? <laughs> so if you want to go in the bedroom, you have to like duck underneath the clothes, that, right? So you're, you're seeing all these different things. And what we try to do when we're framing, we also try to recruit so that there's a chance that patterns will come up. Remember that patterns are what we want to have verifiable uh, data, verifiably observed data. And so we could frame it in a way where we make sure that the stories we hear, we either have to you know, recruit and hear from a lot more people, or we can recruit a smaller set based on certain attributes that we're gonna hear from. We're going to see patterns come out of that, hopefully. Otherwise, we re reframe or re-recruit and add to it, and see where the patterns come out. And when we realize what those patterns are, we're seeing beyond the machine. We're seeing beyond the controls that we've got. We, we're seeing beyond our solution. We're seeing things that people are trying to get done that will spark ideas for us to support them. Or that will show us like within what we've already got, why are, why are our controls uh, only telling what the machine can do? Why don't our controls map to what a person wants to do, right? So that would be like using an existing product but a whole new way of interacting with it. Indy, this is the obvious way, okay? To, to yeah. understand who needs what we are going to give as a solution but this is not the default way. So the obvious way, it's not the default way. This is why we have 2022 and we are still talking about why we have to change this uh, systematic uh, arm. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> why do you think that this is not the way we are dealing with today? So the obvious thing is to, to uh, you know, get to the problem space and then get solution, get the solution space. But we, uh, this is yeah. not the default way. So why? Yeah. Is it, and I'm going to, to, to lead, you know, to uh, <laughs> add some uh, <laughs> flavor here. So. Is it because we are, you know, engineers, so we know the whole solution and we think that this is the solution everyone must follow? Is it because, because as humans, we are attracted to risk, so we want to go fast and to risk? Is it why? Because we still say that uh, if Ford uh, would ask people what they want, they would say, you know, faster horses. Uh, mm -hmm. So why do we still have such issues today? It's, yeah, it's I the most obvious question, but we still have to ask this question. Yeah, that's a beautiful question, by the way, Yanis. Thank you. Um, I think it's systemic. I think it's historic. I think we don't realize that that's what we're swimming in. It comes from the Industrial Revolution, right? Or even before that, where there were certain people who were building these things because it was hard to figure out how to build them. But it was all about building the solution. It was like a one up, you know, the, the looms that would weave fabric versus the hand loom, right? How do we mechanize this? It became a way of thinking. So when tech came around, um, originally what we were trying to do was take a process that existed and encode it. So we were taking an engineering process or a mathematical process and we were encoding it. Uh, eventually we got to like the accounting processes, <laughs> the procurement processes, we're encoding those processes that exist and we're looking for the edge cases in those processes um, because an edge case does not refer to a human. Somehow that happened, I don't know how, but it, an edge case means different ways the process gets done based on certain contexts. And so as a good engineer, you would encode the process and you would encode the edge cases. You would go and figure out what the edge cases are, maybe by doing some research. Um, but the edge cases were parts of the process. So that is just systemic. That's historic, right? This is the water we're swimming in. This is how we do have been doing it for decades, for centuries, in terms of the mechanizing stuff. Mm. And it's well, just, you know... You think that it is still too soon for us and we have to 
we are at the end of this um, phase where we, we gave utility and now we have to think of usability and usefulness. So yeah. this, this yeah. is the story. It's, it is yeah. too soon. I think uh, uh, Mr. Rosenfeld uh, asked, uh, replied to this question and I think he used the words, it is too soon for product, for digital products. So is, it the, is this the case? Is, I don't think is, so. Yeah. Okay. I think we're ready. I think we're ready for it. I think we've had a lot of things happening globally where the awareness has been raised, where we can actually say some of the words like discrimination within the business. And we're getting there. It might not be our, my generation that gets to do it. It might be the people who are just coming into this now who get to do this or the people who follow them. But every one of us is going to help open doors so that another person has more words to use, more choices to make, more techniques to call on. Um, I don't, you know, my method might not exist in another 30 years. That's okay, because somebody will have taken it and shifted it or taken pieces of it and put it together with other things. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay, so yeah, it's time to, to go from utility to usability and, you know, make useful yeah. product this is the usefulness. Um, I'm going to skip question about uh, average solution approach because I think you we we mentioned a lot of uh, you and know. To, Dimitri's here. like doing this. He oh, want to interject yeah, something. Please go ahead. <laughs> I uh, I would like to ask if this is a, an evolution of uh, design for all approach, where you're starting looking at the extremes, yeah. right? People that are not in your target audience. Yeah. then you find solutions for them and this ends up creating a better solution for everyone. So is this driven to a different yeah, level? Yes, perhaps? yes, and yes, and we're not creating a solution. We're creating solutions. Mm -hmm. I want to get us away from that mindset that like there's one product, there's one solution. Um, so, so yes, yes, Dimitri. I mean, design, universal design allowed so many more people to participate in society, in business, in entertainment. Um, the more people who can participate, the better, right? So mm -hmm. if we are doing harm to someone, they're either going to step away or maybe they're forced to use this particular tool in at work, but it's going to be so painful that they're not going to be able to participate in the best way that they can bring, you know, they know they can do this sort of thing, but their, you know, hands are tied. I have to do it this way. And then here comes the depression, right? Another the harm. harm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, more, more people being able to do it the way that works for them using different solutions, variety. I like the word various and variety um, rather than different. Um, so having a variety of solutions for various people or a variety of people. Um, and we're looking at the, the way that I'm approaching it, which could change when somebody you know, improves this, <laughs> is to look at the patterns, see the thinking styles, see the, the parts of the, the approach. That's what builds that city skyline. And look at it stepwise, look at it one, you know, one little set of those towers and the thinking styles in those towers and the solutions that we've brought to them. And let's do measurements. Let's see how much harm we're doing there in very specific and focus on that and change that by creating a variety of approaches. Maybe even it's just one approach has a certain tone of voice and the other approach has another tone of voice. There's a lot of different ways we can make these, we can customize these things. I know way back when, if you were going to wear clothes, those clothes were made for you. Um, well, you made those clothes. The most of us, we would have to make our own clothes. There were some people who were rich enough to ha hire somebody and make clothes for them. Um, but now we just buy, you know, things off the rack and there's a whole history behind how we, you know, how they build them, those clothes to make it so they fit the most variety kind of people. Uh, but what I'm sort of looking at is like, you know, rather than having a, an item, a solution defined for just one person bespoke like that, it's going to be defined for a pattern, a pattern of thinking, a thinking style in a certain area of what they're trying to address within this purpose. And 
and it can be that way that we're not looking at <laughs> we have to design you know 10 billion 8 billion all right solutions <laughs> but just three right just three okay <laughs> yeah just just three for the thinking styles that we're interested in right now that we we have the the wherewithal within our business to support right now and maybe we know that there's another thinking style out there and that's going to be on our on our our roadmap for the organization to go and and support in you know in another 5 years or something yeah right we're we have finite abilities and and this you know time keeps moving <laughs> keeps flowing so being realistic narrowing it down, looking at specifics and getting really good at supporting those specifics and getting really good at then moving on to the next. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Uh, oh, Sakis. Sakis has a uh, question. Sakis, please go on. Yes, thank you. So when we're talking in terms of building solutions uh, that avoid causing harm what what do you say when i ask you what if a solution by default when causing benefit or when being useful to someone may cause harm to someone else in the same organization not deliberately of course Mm -hmm. but because the nature of the function of the solution is such. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Like trying to automate things and people lose jobs. Is that what you're... No, yes, that, that's <laughs> one aspect. Another aspect could be, uh, for example, something that gives the organization um, a, a, a beneficial function that causes the workers inside this fun this uh, organization to be obligated to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Mm -hmm. You're benefiting the organization, yeah. but in in the process, yeah. you're harming another group. Yeah, yeah. So Mike Montiero has just re-released his book "Design Is a Job." Um, I that is his call to all of us to band together to try to stop that kind of behavior within organizations. So that's a good book. Um, there's another example I want to talk about, which is some work I did with an HR, a human resources group within a large company. Um, and within that company, they were noticing that employees were leaving a lot like they were leaving at greater numbers than they had in the past. And true, they were also doing layoffs, but they didn't count those as employees leaving and they wanted to know why. Um, and so this team, this human resources team went and did listening sessions with people about what went through your mind as you were considering leaving this job. And we came up with thinking styles and that human resources group can then help the managers support those employees in different, in ver various ways. There I go with that word different, in a variety of ways. So one of the thinking styles was, um, I'm thinking about leaving because I was promised such and such with this job and I still haven't got it. And I'm tired now of doing the things that, you know, that go along with such and such and not being given the opportunity to do such and such. Um, such and such, sometimes it was a shift. Like I was told I wouldn't have to work the night shift because I have a child at home <laughs> and it's now two years into it. Sometimes it was a project. Sometimes it was a promotion, right? But the thing that I was promised that I expected to have is not coming. There was another thinking style. And, and when you when you recognize that, it's like, oh yeah, okay, I, I understand that. Then as a as a human resources person, you can teach the managers to recognize it and do something about it. 
right? Maybe they forgot that they had promised this person such and such. Um, or maybe they knew it and it just wasn't possible. And so maybe some other sort of compensation would work so that you don't have to lose that person and then rehire someone else. So that in itself, actually, this idea of not losing a person and rehiring someone else was the culture of that human resources group. There are human resources group who don't care. Like, sure, leave, right? We'll go hire someone else. Are we allowed else. to say human resources? I know, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. another another systemic thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, There's another book uh, called Out of Office by Ann Peterson and Charlie, whose name I forget his last name. Um, but they have some really good things to say about how management changed. Management used, like companies used to be, organizations used to be a place where you would stay for your life, for your career. Um, and that shifted, at least in the US in the 80s, where it was now they are resources, just like sheets of paper. And, you know, we've got too many sheets of paper. Let's get rid of some of those resources. Um, and that was a shift with um, the economic approach of some guy whose name I've forgotten, but it came out politically as Reaganomics. Um, so that was a big mind shift. This particular group who's... Um, called human resources still has tried to shift back to the other mindset that isn't true everywhere yeah it's the mindset of army then the mindset of uh, you know human as re uh, industry resources and right. hopefully the next mindset is going to be human as tribes as as persons yeah. as people uh, yeah. redefining what is management leadership teams yes. and how we work together exactly yeah. uh yeah. nikos has a question so great sessions. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So great session so far. Thank you for the very illustrative examples. So let's say that um, we have uh, in front of us a case that, um, you know, it causes harm to someone and uh, we have uh, plenty of evidence to know that. Um, what is your, I mean, guiding policy around um, ethics? Uh, what is ethical and what it isn't? and um, when we should draw a line and push for a change. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I'm thinking a lot about this and uh, very, very uh, commonly, uh, I see other people thinking about this. So I would like to have your view. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna say my answer, but I'm gonna say that it's very much guided um, by what, Mike Montiero is writing about by what Kenneth Bowles is writing about um, is that if we, we need to build our awareness, I'm not going to say we're going to be able to change, but awareness is the first step. It sounds like Nikos, you have this awareness. A lot of people you're talking to have this awareness, like, Hey, what we're building here actually has some harms to some people unintentional or even intentional like that was what it was meant to do and so what i need to do is you know either try to make a case at that organization to shift the organization by through the relationships of trust that i've already built um, through being able to come up with different mindset approaches like what if um to use that earlier example where um doing something somewhere harms some of the employees if we can recognize that if we can then do some thinking around how do we mitigate that how do we shift the way that we're approaching things and it it takes a lot i mean it it takes that whole shift away from that idea of human resources as well, which is not necessarily something we're going to be able to pull off individually, but as a field, we probably can. If we 
you know, can point to e each other's writing, if we can point to each other's presentations about it, if we can point to these examples, it's like, hey, you're, there are lots of other orgs who are doing this. How about us, right? The sh shame, shame them into doing it. <laughs> um, shame itself is a harm. So that's why I'm laughing about saying that. Um, but the idea also of leaving that organization, uh, the person that I know well, whose boss was telling them to make a chat bot left the organization. It was just a really toxic organization. They, they told me a story about one of the other uh, peers um, telling them, yeah, I'm overwhelmed, but in a good way, right? And their comment was like, how, how is that good? <laughs> That's an oxymoron. That is a false statement, right? <laughs> you can't be overwhelmed in a good way unless it's everybody coming to wish you happy birthday and giving you flowers. <laughs> Right. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, Mike uh, Montiero's book has a lot of interesting stuff that um, that that can help define it. Same with Kenneth Bowles' um, book, and um, the I think the underlying bit is that it becomes a movement. If we become a movement, we will have strength. We won't have strength if we have no trust, if we forget to build those relationships, mm -hmm. right? So the relationships is a really important thing that you can start working on tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Relationship building is done through listening. And so, that's, uh, yeah. do you have, it's about time that do you have uh, some more minutes to discuss about listening, yeah. about oh, yeah. listening and deep listening. You know, uh, Jamie Levine yeah. describes this book as a game changer. Uh, so, yeah, this, interviews are are not just are interviews today aren't listening sessions. So yeah, they're not listening sessions. What what we're doing right now is not a listening session. Okay, okay. So what okay. is deep listening? What is the listening yeah. sessions? Is it a, a different user research method? Is it a book yeah. of good practices in current methodologies? What is listening? It's a it's a different research method. It's an additional research method. I'm not throwing out interviews. They have a place. This is an additional research method, but it's also a relationship building method. And this is trying to understand someone's interior cognition as they addressed their purpose. So if you have a manager who makes some sort of weird decision, you can go and sit down with that manager on a Zoom call <laughs> um, or even do it via email or text messaging. Listening can be done through any channel that works for communication and connection. And what you're trying to do is say, hey, I'm going to define it by that decision you made. That was your purpose, right? You made that decision. What went through your mind leading up to that? I want to understand it better. I understand your thinking. I don't want to talk about my thinking. I want to understand yours. Okay. When we do it for research, we're doing it the same way. Hey, how did you take care of your clothing over the past couple of weeks? I'm not defining take care of your clothing as doing the laundry. That might come up. It did a lot, <laughs> but other things did as well. Things like looking at the label on items that I'm going to buy to see how it needs to be taken care of because I have a certain approach to taking care of my laundry. Okay. so. Um, when you listen, you don't have a list of questions that you're going to ask. You're not going to bring up any topics. This is a situation where the other person is going to own the conversation and lead the conversation. And to do that, to make it easy for them, you have to define their purpose. And you have to find someone who's done a lot of thinking about that person I, that purpose in the past. So always do an intro session with everybody that you are going to set up a listening session with. You don't do this with your manager. You don't need an intro session. Um, but with research, you always do an intro session, not only to explain to them, hey, you know, this is, it isn't really going to be an interview, but more of like a discussion about what went through your mind. 
and you do a little test in there to make sure that they feel comfortable with it. Uh, you don't want someone to feel uncomfortable. There's a whole chapter in here about making sure the other person is comfortable and how you build a little sensor in your mind so that you can tell whether they're feeling comfortable with this topic or direction or your extra questions about it, and you, you stop. There's also a chapter in here about your own comfort level and being triggered and how to take care of yourself. Um, but this idea of a sensor, a listening session is all about paying rapt attention to the other person and letting your sensor figure out if you've gotten to their interior cognition. So what's interior cognition? There's, there's outer layers. Those outer layers are where we're explaining how something works or why it's done that way. We're saying statements of fact, like how many times it's done um, or how many uh, you know, countries I visited or whatever, right? Um, there are context setting, scenario setting, uh, kind of things. Like I was in this restaurant when, you know, this thing happened and then I thought, blah, blah, blah. My thought is interior cognition. You need to know that that descriptive layer to be able to get to the interior cognition. There's also a layer just under the descriptive layer, which is kind of my expression layer, which is all the opinions and preferences that I have built up from my experiences and my interior cognition. Those are very interesting to market research. We are not doing market research. We are doing design research. So we also skip past those. In fact, often I will dig into them. If there's a really strongly held opinion about something, I wanna know how it got formed. What was the interior cognition that went into that way back in history sometimes? So that's one of the techniques. It's like, well, you know, where did that come from? Let's figure that out. So this little sensor is sensing like, is this interior cognition or is this one of those other layers, the expression layer or the description layer? If it's interior cognition, great. I'm getting three things out of it. I'm getting inner thinking, I'm getting emotional reactions and I'm getting guiding principles, which are personal rules that people apply to situations to make something happen and make a decision or do something. So those three things, interior uh, and co cognition are inner thinking, emotional reactions and guiding principles. I have this great um, image in here. Where... I was just about to, to show this yeah. image. I hope that this oh, yeah. is shown, which is, you know, yes. all, the, all the debates, what is market research, what is user research, how we're going to go, you know, into uh, interior cognition layers. There is an image here. Uh, you describe uh, it as a candy having layers, yes. which is, you know, it is now stuck in my head, I think, for all of my, the rest of my life. And it is going to be the, the base that I'm going to describe anything uh, using this image. Um, now, with that image, the candy, all the time, people are like, oh, great. So we're figuring out the candy of that person's head. I'm like, yeah, yeah, pull it closer. It's not, what page is that? I'll see. Somebody else can get it in there while I'm talking. Um, it is not a person. We're so used to like wanting to make a model of a whole that explains the whole person. Like that's why we have horoscopes and stuff <laughs> like that, right? It is not the person. The candy represents a topic. So a person might bring up this topic of looking at labels to decide whether or not to buy this piece of clothing. And there might be things at the expression layer, like opinions about things. Like I hate taking things to dry cleaners. That actually is a preference, sorry. <laughs> um, there might be explanations about, you know, how they, how, what those little symbols mean <laughs> that they use on those labels. Um, but there's also interior cognition. Like I was holding this one suit top up that was very stylish and I really wanted it, but it was dry cleaning. And so I'm like, well, do I go ahead and buy this because I really want this and I could use it, these certain things. And that's all interior cognition. Okay. And that guiding principle about how, how do I decide? Right. Um, so we have to, to go yeah. there. We have, this is the, our target. Yeah. We have to go. That's the target. So That's your target. sensor, your sensor is noticing whether the person's comfortable, but also whether they're close to interior cognition. And we imply a lot of our co interior cognition because we're not used to talking about it to somebody else. And so you're noticing if they're implying something. And I call that a pull tab. It's like, you can 
pull it open and help them unfold what's inside that interior cognition that they that they had in the past about that topic. So each candy is a topic. We've got a lot of candies that people bring up, um, put on the table, so to speak. <laughs> and we're and all we do is help them unfold their interior cognition. We go from candy to candy and they're bringing things up. We might go back to this other candy that they didn't finish unfolding. That's it. And, and we're done when we're done. There's no, we never stop. We never say, okay, well, we're at the end. We're done when they're done talking about their topics. And this and kind of technique, you know, it gave, uh, it gives uh, like a, a mapping layer. You can, um, yeah. you can see the topics that uh, they are on the table in this conversation as yeah. different objects. So you can select the objects, you can group the objects, you can select a specific topic and then get into uh, the detail and yeah. let the other speak about yeah. it. And so you are the listener there. Yeah. Here's where I want to say that you don't have to keep track of it all when you're in a listening session you are paying rapt attention to the person. So this becomes more of a conversation. It becomes more of a human to human connection. You're building a rapport with them so that they feel comfortable. You're showing them how much you're paying attention to them. You're only focused on them. You don't really have that much cognition available besides the things in the sensor. Are they comfortable? Is it interior cognition? Um, that you can keep track of all the topics. That's okay. You may not get back to that one topic. And you know, you know, the two of you are just exploring these things and that person then feels like they're done. You ask the classic, well, was there anything else that you wanted to say? You don't say it that way though. You say, when we had that intro session and you were getting ready for this, was there anything you thought you would talk about that we didn't cover? Um, is, is this the, the difference yeah. with the semi-structured uh, interview sessions? And I'm paraphrasing the question of John, uh, with your permission, John, or if you, want to, you can ask your question. Uh, what's the difference? The question is, what's the difference between what is different from yeah. listening sessions, deep listening to semi-structured uh, interviews? Yeah, the, the big difference is the purpose that we start with. Um, because a semi-structured interview is usually looked at through the point of view of the solution and only the solution. So that's a big shift. I think that this big shift is in support of that other big shift that we're trying to do within our field as a movement. We're trying to be human-centered and by all these different methods, we're gonna get there. If we are able to point at each other and what we've done and how other organizations have used it to great success, um, not necessarily only the success of the organization, to the great success of the people. That, those are the stories that are really amazing. Um, so if it's not about the solution, for example, during product discovery, when perhaps, you know, nothing. How is it then different to listening? It's still about the purpose. So you, if you're doing product discovery, I use that example of the clothing, right? Of the washing machine. Um, this this R&D group or this startup has an idea where, where their skills and engineering might lay in terms of solutions but we don't look at it through the solution lens. What is that solution helping someone address? And the purpose can be really narrow, like that something they can accomplish within one hour or really long, like, uh, I don't know, things that you do in your career. Um, it's a, a purpose can be at various levels. And I talk in this book, about how to recognize what those levels are. I also have a course that's called Framing Your Study that gets into it really deeply. Um, all the ins and outs of what does this mean to shift our mindset to look at a person's purpose and how to do that. Lots of examples in there. Uh, that course is a really great course if you have an understanding of what thinking styles are and what deep listening is. Uh, because I assume that you do when I teach that course, because it's one of those chicken and the egg things. 
<laughs> so it's actually the sixth course in my lineup of courses because you need to know everything else or it's better if you know everything else before you take that uh, course. But you know, if you've got this kind of background, jump in. And I do touch on it in the book a little bit. So that's the big difference is that even with a semi-structured interview, um, where we're sort of letting the person lead the way. We, we have these topics in mind. This is how I started out. That's how I was running this. I had these topics that I wanted to make sure I cover. If I introduce a topic in a listening session, that's me taking control back. It's me mentioning something that the other person has not mentioned. And the other person in, in this role suddenly is not the authority, you suddenly become the researcher, the, th the authority, and their natural inclination, not everybody, but quite frequently, they will want to give you something that, that you can use. And so they will try to answer that question that you ask about a topic that they have not done thinking about. And so you'll dance around with, you know, expression layer or the description layer and you can't get to the interior cognition. And here's where I'm going to also say <laughs> it's really important um, when I get a transcript out of this or what, if it's a chat, you know, I've got the transcript right there. I usually get, I'll, I'll go through and I'll pull out those concepts when I'm going to build the city skyline. That's how I do it. I, I, I put, pull out all the inner, inner thinking concepts, all the emotional reaction concepts. Oh, here's a guiding principle. Oh, here's another inner thinking. Wait, that's two inner thinkings. But actually there's an, an emotional reaction in there. So I'm untangling it all. Okay, so that I've got a certain list of these concepts. There's more to that we probably don't have time for. But in the beginning, um, when I first started out, I would get like maybe 35 concepts per transcript. Now I'm getting 60. 80. If the topic is a really thick topic, like I was doing these listening sessions with entrepreneurs um, and oh my, there's a lot on their minds about this certain purpose. Um, the listening sessions generally lasted two hours and we generally pulled 90 to 120 concepts out of those transcripts. But the nice thing is, is that you can start, you, you may not have your sensor completely built, but you can start and still have concepts come out of your transcript. And that's great. That's that I've a lot of people who I have taught, they're all like, I apply this to my value tip as well. So that I'm getting some interior cognition out of it. I like, I'm like, okay, what was this purpose here? And maybe I can ask some questions about it. Okay. So That's yeah. 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 I, I really want to encourage people that there's no, there's no mistakes that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You can start out and not have a completely built sensor for the interior cognition and the safety of the person. Um, yes. You can harm a person if you like make them, you know, keep answering a question that they don't want to answer. Um, but eventually you will realize it and you can apologize to them. It's a very human to human thing. You can feel the connection. It's about paying rapt attention. It's about the connection. It's also about these, this layer that I want to get to, the interior cognition layer. But primarily it's about that connection. And people who are doing it, they're like, wow. I actually look forward to these now, whereas the way that I was doing it before, especially this is the other thing is I only do one a day. Um, this is important. It's in the book. It's self-care. Um, it's also important because it helps you dwell in that person's way of thinking afterward. There's several things that I do directly after um, that allows me to sort of digest it and build my cognitive empathy for that person. I still remember people that I did listening sessions with 25 years ago. Unfortunately, my brain does not keep anything else. <laughs> so you cannot ask few, me trivia questions. <laughs> so a few sessions a day or one session a day in order to have time to digest all the information and you know, run the initial analysis right after the session, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're getting yeah. much information, deep information, you know, information that are unstructured, semi-structured, you know, you, you're getting into the core uh, yeah. of what yeah. the, the person it, has to say. 
it is structured. It's structured by their purpose. Mm. And it's structured that way because I want patterns to come out of this. If we don't structure it by the purpose, we will not necessarily get patterns. And then we've got subjective data. Mm -hmm. We have to add to it more listening sessions to see if we can get patterns out of it. Um, I, I, I think it's great if you go and listen to people like once a week, but do it with a purpose frame. If you do it like just randomly or by, by a solution frame, you're not going to have empirical data. You're going to have subjective data. Awesome. Uh, if you have some more minutes, last question from Dimitris and we can uh, uh, wrap up. Dimitris, uh, a question or a, uh, anything? Yeah. yeah, please go on. Small, go small geek out uh, about uh, listening session. So how do you plan your study? Uh, how do you plan to do, are you doing it in sessions, uh, in rounds, sorry, in sessions? How, how do you plan the logistics of, of this whole thing? Because- Oh, with my, te with my team? Your team, your, uh, the, the, the people that you're talking the, to. Okay, yeah, the, the yeah. The whole thing. Yeah, so yeah. There, it's, part of it is in the book. Um, planning, planning a study sometimes takes two months because we can't figure out what that frame needs to be or what those attributes need to be for recruiting. Mm -hmm. And we go around and around. I have so many, and these are wonderful discussions actually, because this is where I ask the person who, <laughs> and we get to get into it. Like where, where are we coming from? What's our history? What are we after? Who is it that we're trying to support? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for the people who are participating, that is the intro session. So I have a certain way of recruiting. And in fact, I have not ever had a market, re market research recruiting company complete a recruit for me in my entire career, because it's, it's not the thing that they do. I'm asking them to recruit people who have actually thought about this and people who are, who are possibly of this certain thinking style. And that's not something that they do. I think that, um, so I've been doing a lot of recruiting myself and I talk about how to do that a little bit in the book, but really deeply in that course. Um, I use my network. I use all of us in our field, especially I use physical recruits. If we're talking about physical things, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not relying on it being digital because I want to include more people. I want to be specific in my attributes about that. So, um, so once I get a, a set of candidates, I'm having an intro session with each candidate and deciding whether I want them to be a participant. But really, I'm also helping them feel comfortable with this, seeing if they would feel comfortable with this, giving them the chance to tell me I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll withdraw, right? Because it sounds mm -hmm. a little too, a little too personal, right? How do you incentivize them? Because it sounds oh, like a yeah. big process, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I incentivize both the, um, the intro session and the listening session separately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> I talk about this in the, in the framing your study. Um, when you're doing a recruit, you don't have, you, 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 you need to attract, like I like use the analogy of attracting butterflies, um, right? With some sweet pollen. And the butterfly is gonna come along and they're gonna go, wow, great flower. Um, and oftentimes this is the point at which we turn into researchers and throw a bunch of research survey questions at them from our point of view, right? And that is what I call barfing on the butterfly. And the butterfly is like, yikes, get me out of here, <laughs> right? Um, at most like two or three or maybe four questions that are very clear and very simple and only related to that person and that purpose is how I recruit. Mm -hmm. Then we have an intro session where we can discuss a few more things. That's how I recruit. So those are the two sides of it, the team and the participant. 
Great. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Wow, uh, Indy, thank you very much. You gave us today so many valuable insights and tips, so much information to, to consume, to digest. Uh, <laughs> we want to thank you a lot for your time, uh, for being here today. Awesome. Uh, here with the GX uh, Greece community. Thank you everyone for participating, for giving uh, your questions. Uh, I think it was a great discussion. Um, if you have more questions, please ask them on LinkedIn uh, to continue the discussion threads uh, here, uh, there. Yeah. Um, and I love, of, yeah, I love that you were, used the word digest because <laughs> there was a lot to digest and I don't expect anyone to go out and do this right away. Just take, or take like one little thing that stood out for you and think about it for a while. Maybe pick up another book. One of the ones I mentioned, just like mm -hmm. little things, but let's, let's, let's think about ourselves as a movement. And let it grow organically. Yeah. 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 Movement. Great. Great. Let's, well, let's close we, with this, this phrase. Yeah. Please, please. Besides your, besides your website, uh, we have in the comments, LinkedIn, uh, is yes. there anywhere else people can I'm find you? Indy Young at LinkedIn. I'm Indy Young at Twitter. I am Indy Young Underbar at Instagram. And I'm on Mastodon, but I have not figured out how to use it yet. So <laughs> I'm Indy Young something somewhere with dots in front of it. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, social media, uh, you can win uh, some great books. Um, and we are going to give uh, in this latest book, uh, Time to Listen. Yeah. Uh, to, there's, yeah. yeah. There's one other thing I was going to say. Um, yeah. I've been doing this lately. I have a Slack channel as well. Oh. Uh, anybody can join. Uh, so if you want to join, send me your email through my website um, or various social medias. I will take a while to get through all the emails, <laughs> but eventually you'll be on the Slack channel. <laughs> Sounds awesome. So send your email uh, to, to Inti and uh, wait for uh, you know the, <laughs> the invite. Uh, and uh, don't forget to send a message uh, on LinkedIn uh, to, for about in the next you know, three hours three or four hours using the hashtags UX, UX, Greece. Ask anything. We are going to uh, continue the discussions uh, there. Uh, again, uh, um, special thanks to our sponsors from Scratch Studio, Zanzi Labs, the UX Prodigy, and uh, Weather uh, XM. Don't forget to follow the UX Greece community page on LinkedIn. Uh, and also the Thessaloniki and Athens UX communities on meetup.com. And uh, stay tuned for the upcoming uh, events uh, this season. Uh, that's all for today. Any last comment, uh, or we can uh, thanks again, Inti, uh, and uh, wrap up. Yay! Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. <laughs> Take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye guys. Bye.